here to uh, enjoy a little bit of wine with you guys and talk a little bit about the wine world. And we're going to focus on wine clubs today. Hope everybody out there has got a glass of their own and uh, ready to share and talk about your favorite topics in wine. Uh, but today we're going to talk a little bit about wine clubs. We're going to revisit this concept. Uh, last May, I talked about broadly talked about the different ways and different styles and types of clubs and some of their pros and cons. But uh, I recently got a wine shipment in and have had an idea that's been lingering around the idea pool about speaking specifically about wine clubs at the winery tasting level. And some of the advantages that we get out of that that I think that we didn't really um, touch on before. So uh, we're going to actually going to talk a little bit about today about uh, Clinker Brick, the one of the wineries that I'm a, I'm a club member of. Uh, again, no endorsement by them. This is just me telling you about wine that I love as an example of something I do in my own personal life. Uh, you may be part of your own winery wine clubs and can kind of uh, think about some. I'd love to hear what your opinions are, how you what your experiences are, etc. So let us know in the chat or down below in the comments after the uh, show. So winery-based wine clubs. Um, what what is the what are some of the, the the broad spectrum thing here? Well, most wineries that I know of, as at least in the non mega corporation level, um, have some sort of wine club to give access and direct to consumer sales. And the business is called DTC. Uh, this segment uh, has gone uh, gone up over the last uh, few years due to the current health crisis and everything else. So it's kind of has been good for the wineries in that factor, even though they've been suffering from uh, lack of getting customers directly involved in their winery, uh, you know, shutting down wine rooms and things like that. But almost everybody's got some sort of program where you can sign up at one level or another to be part of their exclusive club. Um, you're almost always going to see this pitch at the end of your wine tasting when you visit a winery. Um, you're, you know, if you've had a nice toasty little tasting and you're there and you're happy and you've been enjoying wine for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour or so, then they're going to try and sell you something. Now, uh, generally speaking, you know, I'm not I'm not a salesperson. That's not my my forte. But I do really appreciate the, re the reason and the need for wineries to kind of operate like this. Um, so you might wonder, I mean, certain wineries you might be visiting that you are that you've seen in, you know, in either liquor stores or even at the grocery store, for instance. Um, these larger popular wineries, you know, why would they need access to you, a consumer, if you could still just buy their product right off the shelf? And that's uh, an interesting kind of uh, uh, diet, you know, kind of a kind of a, a an opposite, right? So that, that you're trying to think of, and a kind of a conundrum that you're like, well, why should I do this? Well, um, some of the reasons that are good for wine clubs, and the reasons that uh, I think you should consider joining them, uh, especially. Um, when it comes to the smaller scale stuff is, number one, you get access. Uh, and I don't just mean access to, to, the, to, the, to the winery itself. I mean the actual access to wines that you're maybe not going to be able to get outside of joining club membership. Um, also, um, convenience and cost considerations. They're often wines are going to be, if you join their club, they're going to sell wine at a discount. Broadly speaking, the cons of joining their club are it's a delayed gratification game, right? Um, you're, you're, you're buying something that you're not going to get until, you know, usually most of these things ship usually either every quarter or sometimes a couple of times a year, depending on the program you join. So you're not getting wine right this second, which can be, you know, less fun in the purchasing project rather than, you know, walking out with a bottle directly from the winery. Um, and then, there, of course, there's a reverse to the cost calculation. That is, if you aren't carrying it out, you're paying somebody to ship it to you, which can sometimes mitigate some of the cost. So let's dive into some of these uh, more specifically. Um, first thing is why choose any individual winery club? Uh, my first answer, which kind of might seem, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, well, duh, it seems really obvious, and that is you love their wines. Um, you walk into a winery and you taste their wines or you've had their wines before and you're visiting a favorite that you already have. You simply love the product that they make and you want to support the business. I mean, God, that's you know the almost honest and easy way um, to support a business you love is to give them your business. Well, that's great. Um, but it can get kind of overlooked as to what the benefit there is, uh, especially when we're, when we're talking about wineries that are smaller and independently owned. Every little bit of business counts. You know, small businesses, small medium-sized businesses have a lot of important, uh, you know, 
goals to meet and challenges that they face that when they're not part of some of these huge mega wineries. Everything from cost of scale to, to just simply uh, challenges in the market can cause them to struggle a little bit more. So every member of that winery club is a direct form of, of revenue that generally speaking is more valuable than if you were say a grocery store or liquor store customer. Why? Because you're supporting the business directly and the price that they're selling you, they're generally giving you the wine at a discount so that you're not paying the same price you would at the retail shelf. However, they are selling you the wine at a markup that gives them a larger portion of that margin. So in other words, they're making more per bottle when they sell it to you directly than if they had to pay a distributor to come in, get that wine to your to your area, then into a liquor store, and then into your hands, right? That all comes with a fairly significant cost. So while they might, you might, let's say you pay $40 a bottle at the at retail. They may offer it to you for, you know, anywhere from 20% off or more if you purchase it through their club. And all of that money that they're making is going directly back to them, not into a distributor. So. Uh, you know, thank the 18th Amendment for distributor problems in the three-tier system, but the reality is you are actually giving them a better dollar per bottle, which is basically really important for small wineries. Um, another reason you might choose a particular winery is that you want this access to limited or club-only wines. Uh, almost all the wine clubs that I've ever seen definitely offer this as a, as a feature. They want to help you pick their wines and want to lure you in with specials that are exclusive to just club members. And that's kind of cool. Um, that is actually kind of the impetus for the show is that I want to talk not only just today, but I want to do a featured wine tasting about the pros, the real pro side of joining one of these wine clubs and the things that you get. Um, so the exclusivity is a tricky kind of point for me. Um, generally as a business process or a business practice rather, I try and make sure that the wine that I'm teaching with and teaching about, uh, my goal is to engage with my customers where they're drinking already, right? To find out where they're drinking their wine in their daily lives, helping them go through that wine journey, possibly enhancing that wine journey. Um, that usually means we're accessing fairly common wines, meaning wines that are easy to get at your grocery store, liquor store, you know, local, wherever. Um, you're not getting these, we're not talking about these exclusive club wines in those tasting venues because I don't think it's fair to introduce customers to something at one of my tastings that they then can't go out and buy for themselves, right? That doesn't seem like a very good uh, good practice. So that's my one kind of business practice. But on the other hand, when you get to a certain point in your wine journey, starting to seek out uncommon wines is necessary to advance. You need to be able to find the things that you're not just going to run across. Because the fact is, we're awash in a sea of decent to good level wine um, across, you know, as I said, they're available every, at all these places where retail exists. Getting the, to the great level often requires a little bit more work. Either A, access to a specialty wine store, which as we've talked many times, not everybody has, or B, by going directly to one of these clubs to get things that are, that are off the beaten path. Now, winery direct clubs, as I said, are Pigeonholed because they have, they're only the product from that one particular winery, but you're doing a lot of good for every bottle you buy. So uh, again, I am, pro, I am both pro wine club, but don't use it in my average everyday tastings simply because again, access is an issue and I'm not here to sell you on any clubs. You know, I'm here to, to show you some of the things that I enjoy. Um, but when it comes to teaching, I want you to be able to buy the, you know, buy the product yourself afterwards. So what else? Um, let's see. So if you're trying to get more engaged in the winemaking process overall, in other words, if you're at that point in your wine journey, wine clubs are an excellent vehicle for that. Uh, most clubs offer insider information on how the winery is doing, how the wines are particularly developing, what they're producing, and when and why. Um, my shipment came with a nice little letter from, uh, from the winery. Uh, from the winemaker uh, Steve Felton talking about, hey, here's what's going on right now in Lodi, where this wine is made, how this 2022 year is shaping up, you know, what the weather's like, what this is going on, the 2021 crop is coming in out of, you know, coming in and being barreled. You know, they've got this whole kind of insight. So if that interests you, if that's something where you want to to, to try out the differences, for instance, in between vintage years or 
like we're doing today, we're trying a little single vineyard uh, Zinfandel. This is, you know, compared to say their, what we call their flagship mainline uh, Old Vine Zinfandel, you can compare and contrast the two. Not, ex I, I would call that not necessarily the basic wine level, that's moving into that intermediate territory. So wine clubs are great for exercising that. Um, we talked another thing about money. You might want to join a wine club because you want to save money. Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, delivery, which is probably the most common challenge to uh, to this, basically can negate your cost of discount, which is good. Meaning that you know, for if you're going to pay for twenty dollars a bottle at retail and you're going to get a discount plus shipping cost, you end up basically at the same price. So I wouldn't necessarily look to it to get you know cheap wine. You're not going to get really inex you're not going to get a huge example or a, or a huge advantage there rather. So expect that if you have to have your wine shipped to you. However, if you the secondary benefits of things um, are are pretty multitude. Rarely is their wine club limited to just hey you get exclusive access and you get a discount. You, you, if you are close to where that winery is, if you're fortunate enough to live in wine country and you have a favorite winery, I absolutely recommend uh, joining their club. Simply for the fact that for you know the couple hundred dollars a year that you're going to purchase wine and get to drink that's exclusive to you and effectively, and, and if you live close, you can actually skip the shipping process and just go pick up your wine. And they usually have pickup parties and cool stuff like that. You'll also see on-site events, exclusive club member only events, um, you can get free tastings when you go into the wineries. You'll get a discount on bottles that you buy there. In other words, your savings get way multiplied if you happen to be local to a winery. So show that local loyalty. You know, join your local, whatever you uh, you're happen to be around the corner winery. If you like what they do, it's a great way to support them and a great way to, to, to really enjoy a lot of wine and save yourself some cash. So always a good thing. So uh, the other note on cost, though, just to kind of remember, is that Billing cycle slash delivery, most wineries are really good about telling you when shipments are coming and letting you sometimes, you can either, sometimes you can get wine where they're just going to give you a package of wine and say, here's what this spring selection is. Sometimes you can customize it and choose uh, and change what your order is. Also, you can tack on additional wine, often at a discount, to get yourself free shipping. So be aware, though, when those cycles come because it's often outside your regular purchase habits and you don't get surprised by going, oh crap, I've got a $200 wine bill that I just showed up and you know I was not suspect expecting that. So just be aware that that is another thing. Set yourself a calendar reminder, you know, do the thing. So uh, in shipping considerations, there's one another thing I want to talk about and that is, remember our local laws are a very big patchwork due to uh, prohibitions rep repeal and how we patched back together the alcohol system in America. So check, it's, it honestly, it has generally moved up to the state level now. Um, laws have become a little bit more homogenized over, over years, but check your wine club, make sure that they ship to your area. And sometimes, and in some states, it gets down to even the county level, whether they will or will not ship, which is why wineries will often not even ship to whole states, simply because their laws are too Byzantine. That's, I'm seeing that less and less in the modern world, which is great. I'll hear it for freethegrapes.org. We're working the advocacy programs for that. But make sure that you know the rules for your uh, delivery. Um, number one, remember wine is a fragile product. You need to keep it out of the heat or out of the cold uh, and protect it. So in Texas, for instance, we have to be, you have to have somebody who's of legal drinking age, and you also have to be sober, it seems, um, to sign for or at least hand over delivery for in-person delivery. Now, there's been some changes and upsets to that during COVID because everybody got to have their booze. But reality is, being home to be able to receive it is a very important thing. If you work off site and you're not home a lot, you might want to figure out a way to get your wine shipped to somewhere that's, that has a receiving consign for you. I had problems in the past when I worked out of the house, when I wasn't here in the house, uh, that I'd get a wine order delivered to me. You know, FedEx would come and drop, try and drop it off. There was nobody to sign for it. They'd take it back. I'd try come the next day. They'd miss them. I'd end up having to go down to the local uh, distributor and pick it up anyway, which really wasn't anything more convenient uh, that kind of negated the convenience of getting delivered anyway. So be careful. Check that out. Use that as a consideration and make sure you have the ability to uh, get things delivered. For instance, you might want to deliver to your office directly where you happen to be during the usual nine to five delivery hours. 
Okay, well, uh, with that being said, we're not going to do the grocery store grab today. We're actually going to do the club grab here. So normally we talk about uh, wines and wine labeling within uh, the grocery store grab. We talk about how to make good choices and picking up wine at the grocery store where you may not have uh, a lot of assistance uh, for knowledgeable wine staff. Well, in this case, we're assuming that you know kind of the wines that you're getting because you're part of their club. Well, at least broadly speaking, you may never have had their particular wine that you've got. In fact, today's selection, the uh, Maria Vineyards, uh, this is a 2018 Old Vine Zinfandel. Uh, sorry, I didn't get a logo on uh, for on screen use there. Let me turn that that way. But they are right, single vineyard. Uh, this is the 2018, and I've never had this particular uh, wine before. And I've been to this vineyard. Uh, I've been to this vineyard a couple times and really enjoy uh, Dave's wine. So, uh, or Steve's wines, rather. So Steve makes great great booze, but I've never had this before, which is great. This is, a, this is the reason I joined the wine club, that I wanted to get access to things that I wasn't getting all the time. Now, a statement of clarity here, I can get Clinker Brick products fairly reliably at several different locations in my area. Uh, however, they are what I call the mainliners, meaning it's his old vines Infandel, the Ferra Syrah, and maybe the Ghost Finds if you're if you're lucky. Those kind of three big selections are fairly easy to find, but the other stuff not so much. So that's another reason why I joined. I was like, I love I love the, the the wine and the wine program that they have there. I love what Steve does with this booze, and I wanted to to get I wanted to try all of it. So we're trying first things first today. So, the 2018. Now, so let's talk about old vines. Um, I've talked about this a couple times in different analogies, but let me let me revisit. When we talk about old vines, there's it's not really anything that's regulated that makes a vine old. There is no rule that says you must be this tall to ride this ride. So be wary of that. However, mo the term uh, old vines in, in U.S. really tends to flow towards the Zinfandel world. Uh, Lodi and a lot of the Central California San Joaquin uh, growers, I think, nearly pioneered its use. Uh, but I'm, don't quote me on that one, because but almost all the references I've ever heard come to that. The reason is they're some of the only possessors of said old vines. They're some of the longest continuously active vineyards in our nation because they were able to stay open during firm, uh, during uh, prohibition by selling off grapes as regular fruit as as fruit table grapes or. Uh, other methods that kept them in operation. So we have we have the ability to have vines that are hundreds of years old. Uh, this in particular, the uh, Marissa Vineyard, was established in 1928. It's a 92-year-old vineyard that was planted on its own rootstock, which is head-trained and mostly dry-farmed. What that means is head-training is basically letting the thing, uh, getting up to its, sprune, its spurs go up, and then just kind of letting it go. It's got, it's not really, it's a very bushy style of uh, vine training uh, that produces these wonderful, gnarly looking uh, old school vines. Um, very popular for Zinfandel in this area, by the way. Uh, dry farming, right? So we're talking about minimal to no irrigation at all. And uh, so the, these grapes are older. Now, the older the grapes get, the less fruit that they produce, but the more intense the flavor, hence the attraction to old vine uh, wines. Uh, now, of course, this is a challenge for a winemaker because they're producing less less tons less tons per acre. They can become a less viable product depending on how expensive your land is. This is why the practice of keeping very old vines around has kind of fallen out of fashion, except for a few specific areas of the world. So, um, this is the. Uh, McColney River uh, Lodi AVA. This is basically sits just north of the river on the on the San on the uh, River Delta that goes out towards San Francisco. It is a great place to get that cool that cool of breeze from the ocean that blows all the way up the river, basically all the way up the delta, and that's those cool winds keep the grapes from getting overripe during the hot summers in the Central Valley. Uh, so this is um, a great example of what this style in this particular area is. Um, just just based on what I'm reading uh, before even trying it, this is kind of iconic Zinfandel. That is actually one of the specialties of Clinker Brick. So I am, as you may tell, unsurprised that that's what they've got. Their regular old vine Zinfandel, I think, is an average 62-year age, average vine age. And he makes some other wines. He's got some other vines that are in his neighborhood there within a block or three 
that are over 100 years old um, that make wines for other places across the valley. So really amazing uh, and, and truly cool spots to be in. Um, however, with that three to four ton per acre production, there's only 1,200 cases of this wine produced. So this is another example of not a lot of it out there. Um, says in the tasting notes, now the tasting notes I'm reading are from the 2017, not 18 vintage, but I'm looking through several years of this, I went to the industry site and looked up the data sheets. This again is an intermediate wine practice to advanced wine practice here. I wouldn't expect most people to, you know, summon up their phones and go looking up a data sheet for wine until you're at a level where, you know, you have the appropriate give a shit for such things. You may just want to drink tasty wine. Um, on this wine label for that, for instance, this wouldn't really make the cut of our grocery store grab because there's not a lot of info on here. No info about flavor or anything else. So I had to go to the web to go to this data sheet to get that information, which again, Steve, if you're listening, give it to another label or put a cool uh, QR code on there that links right to the data sheet. That would be truly 2022. So uh, this, but reading it through the, uh, the rest of the uh, data sheet here, there's a lot of Wine Geek great information here, including the production, maturation on its oak program with 18 months on American oak, was macerated for 10 days. ABV is a scorching 15.4. This is a big boy. Um, Cooperage and Radu, that's the uh, that's the style of oak, uh, so that's the actual oak brand. Um, then we've got the harvest date. This In this case, again, it's not going to match up with my wine. This is, this is the wrong year. Um, and at what particular bricks? Bricks, B-R-I-X, by the way, is a degree of sugar concentration. It's used to determine ripeness. It's also the name of the Clinker Brick Wine Club. Kind of clever. Uh, pH is six, uh, of this one, uh, again, not, may not be the same on my wine, um, was listed at 3.63. So we're talking closer to four means much less acidic. Um, not unacidic, just on the lower end. But I'll be honest with you, since it's not 3.8, 3.9, that's not bad. Uh, Tartratable acids in there are seven grams per liter. So yeah, this is not a wildly acidic wine. We're not looking for sharp, juicy acids in this. These tend, clicker brick and Zinfandels like this tend to be big, dark, jammy, blueberry, plums, uh, blackberries, black, you know, black currants, that flavor family as a primary, uh, rather than the brighter, juicier things that we think out of, say, oh, cherries that you might get out of a Pinot Noir. So let's give it a go. Color-wise, the thing is inky and dark like my heart. It is really, really concentrated, and you, I mean, you can't even, my, the glow of my monitor does not even penetrate the deep darkness of this, uh, of this very voluptuous little wine. Uh, the rim color, I mean, it's got so much concentration, it kind of stains the rim as I roll it around. So I know that this is very high concentration, a lot of grape in the glass, and uh, it's going to have, just by, the, just by the eyeballs alone, this is some, some big... Heavy, heavyweight juice, um, not your really lighter style of Zinfandel, more quaffable. This is more on that concentrated side. On the nose, wow, it's a it's a baking spice box and pie and pie shop, right? We've got all kinds of. I want to say black, I want to say blueberry because it, it smells on a little on the sweeter side and like blueberry jam, right? Or a blueberry muffin because there's this um, there's this warm pastry baked. Cinnamon night like tone, not quite and not quite cinnamon, but warm. Um, cardamom was one is a word that I often hear associated with these zins from Lodi. Having served an interesting lamb dish of a of a Zinfandel braised lamb, where cardamom was a featured spice, I really see the parallel now. And you guys should go out and try that. Go to your spice cabinet, grab some cardamom seeds, grind them up fresh, and smell that. And get that so that that warm spice smell locked into your brain. This wine has a great little note of it. But yeah, very spice, very very dark blue fruits, black fruits. Smells soft. It doesn't have that sharp um, acidic tone to it at all, right? So we even by reading our data sheet before, we know we're not looking at big, pingy, high high tone, you know, up here. So Lordy, that's a mouthful. My, my, my. It is indeed. I want to announce my presence with authority, right? Come, I mean, full mouthfeel. Big, big fruit. Um, 
the alcohol surprisingly tamed down not so much until the very end of my palate. I'm feeling it right now. So the it's not a big kick of alcohol in the first, which isn't therefore it's not interrupting uh, the fruit profile. Um, yeah, the 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 malolactic on this really lets that it gets the it gets the fruit into the side walls of your palate. It really gets this mouth filling feel, and it then goes from fruit to spice delivery to this like you know it's that end toasty thing that we're getting both out of the oak and we're getting out of the malolactic where we've got butter. And a little, you know, it's like that baked pie crust kind of thing just lingering around. And then there's a little center stripe of fruit down the middle that kind of then transitions into more of a, uh, not quite licorice, but um, more of a more of an herbal thing right down the middle, uh, almost cabernet like in that in that particular aspect. Oh yeah, wow, man. So this, you like big, chewy, you know, serious on your brow wines. What's great is, I think this wine would be a great, you know, little couch wine. Basically just, you know, sit by itself, enjoy some conversation, have some nice, big, bold wine. Because the wine's got it going on. It's very interesting all on its own. Um, if you're going to pair this with food, it has to have some substance to it. Um, I guess, again, things like... Uh, you know, pork, game meats, beef, fatty, fatty meats, venison, things like that, bison, those would all be the right proteins. And in preparation wise, I would aim for things like braising or or slow cooking would be great, but also stuff on the grill, um, especially with a good degree of like cracked pepper or salt on here. It's gonna be an excellent partner with that. Just good old good old fashioned grilled steak. But um, you know, duck might well, even like kind of be fun here with that kind of little fatty gaminess that duck brings. But yeah, lower, slower, grilled, get those Maillard reactions uh, to assist you on your palate. Um, vegetables are gonna have to have some stand up too here, right? So we're talking about um, root vegetables, mushrooms, um, you know, maybe some, maybe some zucchini, which I'm not a huge fan of, but has a fairly reasonably weighty taste. Um, I would say legumes and beans would also do okay, depending on how you spice them. Um, but stay away from the from the light greens and the salad level stuff. It's probably not going to help you. Um, herbs and such, though, sage and thyme would be excellent uh, partners here, where they really would enhance that uh, that middle palate of, of uh, uh, herbaceousness. So it would be a lot of fun. And then cheese wise, I would stick to again aged cheeses with a good degree of salt content that have you know a little bit of statement to them. Get your bigger cheddars out, your Parmesan, um, you know, don't, don't, this is not, not a cheese, this is not a brie cheese kind of uh, wine. This is definitely a bigger, uh, saltier, heavier style. So, great with your charcuterie style stuff too. Anything in that dried meat, cured meat, peppered meat, beef jerky, you know, have it with a Slim Jim. Woo! Well, Christine says, it sounds, sounds delicious. Well, like, it is, Christine Miles. It is definitely delicious and you should try and find some. Um... And I'll be honest with you, so price point on this, by the way, I think uh, it's about 25 I want to say. Um, so by the time I got my bottles, again, it was a net zero um, for, I'm getting them basically at the same price that I would if I was shopping there, which is great. But um, I definitely think this is a, a notch up from their standard Old Vine Zinfandel, but you can get that for about 20 bucks at a lot of places, and I recommend you seek it out. If you guys want to try something that's very similar, click or pick Old Vine Zin. And recommend two thumbs up, all that sort of stuff. How many wine glasses do I have to show or whatever? So, although I'm not in the review business, you know, I certainly love to tell you guys and share what we've got. So, uh, any other questions uh, that anybody's got who happens to be online and listening? If anybody out there, I'll take a couple of seconds and do this while I, while I babble about uh, up and coming things. So, uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know, I used to be a web designer back in my youth and I spent most of my day working on revamping the Wine Shark website, so I've still got content to fill in and some an SSL certificate to figure out. But what I really wanted to tell you guys about, though, is kind of a consolidation of services um, and really kind of crunching things down to be much more uh, simple with with examples rather than required menu picking. Um, I've found in my experience that most people just want to say, "Here's my date, book my thing, call me, and we'll talk about it." So. Tried to streamline that process. 
Um, we're going to be reviewing the tour process and trying to get people interested in doing more tours um, within time windows rather than within specific dates. And uh, uh, generally just a dust it off business improvement um, for my folks that are on Patreon. Um, I owe you guys a lot of content. I've been feeling like I've not really addressed Patreon very well at all. And I want to, I'm making a commitment to, to you and to myself to, uh, to get back to some online content that's exclusive to Patreon. Uh, pre-recorded videos with uh, wine content that was similar to our Zoom meetings. Our Zoom meetings have become impractical to coordinate, it seems, at least with any sort of actual uh, critical mass to make conversation and stuff go. So, I get it. None of us wants to be on Zoom anymore. We're, this is not 2020. We're done with that shit. So, instead, pre-recorded content that you can consume and have a party with at any of your convenience is kind of the goal. And that'll be Patreon only. Plus the uh, the editions of uh, monthly recipes and wine pairing specifics. So there's that. Uh, no news on local events yet. Still trying to get some restaurants to sign where the line is dotted so that we can do some stuff. Uh, Christina asks, how long can we store wine at room temperature? Uh, generally speaking, I wouldn't store... Okay, we talk about storing it closed. The answer is I wouldn't recommend past a year or so, but... This is the question, the question on what room temperature we're talking about. Stability is a key factor in long-term storage. It is better to have a temperature that is less than ideal. For instance, when you store stuff in a professional cellar, they're going to store it at like 53, 55 degrees Fahrenheit with like 80% humidity. Well, if you don't have a wine refrigerator or cellar like that, if you store it in an interior closet of your home, it keeps it out of the light and it keeps it away from odor and then it keeps it at a relatively consistent temperature. Even if it's 70 degrees in that in that closet, in, as long as it's 70 degrees in that closet year round, and it doesn't go from say 40 in the winter and 90 in the summer, your wine will last a pretty long time. I would call it, I would safely say at least two to three years about what wines are normally, what regular wines are designed to kind of uh, go for their lifespan anyway. If you're really looking to age something past the five year mark and really kind of see its longevity, I would recommend spending that $200 to get an inexpensive small wine cellar. Uh, these little wine fridges are really, uh, you know, really good. So unopened 70 degrees. Yeah. So 70 degrees is going to be fine for a couple of years. So long as you're not, you know, so it's not variating. You're going to be good. Um, but remember, no light, no heat, no odor, and no vibration. Meaning if you happen to live next to a, a railway, for instance, it's not good for storing wine long term. But you ought to be pretty good for a couple of years at least. So don't, you know, don't, don't, don't expect to, to last for, you know, 25, but I think your collection is probably pretty safe. But look into a, into a wine fridge. I mean, I really can highly recommend for just a couple hundred bucks, you can get one of these 16, 20, 32 bottles. I don't know how much you're storing, uh, but that's a great way to, to just start uh, keeping anything special that you're going to last over a long time. So my wine fridge has been broken for a while and I need to update it, I actually. Santa and my mother co co collaborated to get me a new one, and I haven't picked one out yet. So I guess I should probably do that. <laughs> feel bad. So thanks, Mom. Thanks, Santa. You guys are amazing. So anyway, all right, guys. Well, I hope to see you again next week. Um, if you guys have wine topics that you guys want to discuss, for instance, excellent questions from Christine about storage temperature, we can review that topic again, and I'll be glad to do a deep dive in a little bit more with some examples. Um, so more than happy to, to touch on those points or whatever it is that you're interested in. If you like what we're doing, hit that like and subscribe button down below. If you really like what we're doing, join us over on Patreon and get us, you know, get that, that exclusive content and show our real support for you. So, all right. Oh, oh, nice. Christina says she converted an old TV armoire into wine storage. Yeah, that's, that is great. Um, on your fridge though, don't store for too long there. That actually is a more dangerous environment than that. Uh, for your refrigerator temperature is too cold to store for lengths of time. I wouldn't recommend storing them more for then say a month or so. Otherwise that cold is going to suppress flavors. They're not going to taste as, as fruity and awesome as they should down the line. So drink fast, Christine. That is my advice. And wait then we'll, we'll get you guys into a, maybe I'll do a, a review thing of my selection process for the, for the wine, for the wine fridge. Because if that would help you guys, in any way, plus it would help me get off my ass and do the work. <laughs> I think it'd be great. So until next time, guys, thank you guys for your patronage. Thank you guys for watching. I have been your wine shark. Cheers.
Oh, it's going to be a good night with that. Y'all have a great night.